elements, 3D elements. And uh, you will find out that you need to input the material properties. Where do you get the material properties? Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, torsional stiffness, bending stiffness, and all that stuff. So what I have been working on uh, called the mechanics of a structured genome is a theory basically can power the traditional finite element method can deal with the advanced structures materials. You'll find out that you, when you learn finite element class, you maybe you only deal with aluminum, you know, some homogeneous isotropic materials. But uh, in the current days, with additive manufacturing, 3D printing, we can make all kinds of new materials, meta materials, all the heterogeneous and anisotropic materials. How do we still use what you learned in class to deal with yeah. these kind of materials? That is uh, what we we are going to be talking about. And uh, I'm a professor uh, at Purdue University right now. It's uh, in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. If you haven't heard about this university, this university, you know, Neil Armstrong, you may heard about him, the first man on the moon, uh, actually graduated from my department and his statue is right in front of my office. So if you have a chance to visit us, and you can take a photo there. And my building, the off where my office is located, called the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering. And first, a little bit about myself. And uh, I received my PhD uh, from Georgia Tech. That was uh, almost 20 years ago. And I'm currently a professor. And also, actually, I stayed at Utah for 10 years. So I know Utah very well because I worked at the sister university called Utah State in, in Oregon, Utah for 10 years. And I actually visited University of Utah, particularly mechanical engineering a few times. I have a few good friends there. And I'm also, the, I'm also the director of Composite Design Manufacturing Hub. It's a website you will find out is a very powerful website provided as a service for the global composite community. And uh, you not only get the regular website you can discuss, form the group, do the project management, management, and also you can launch computer codes, like you find an element code directly within web browser. And I'm also the chief technology officer for Anaswift, a small company uh, focusing on commercializing uh, the research product uh, from what I'm doing. Uh, in the university. I'm also the chair for uh, ASME. Some of you know that the American Society for, uh, for Mechanical Engineers, the aerospace division in charge of 5,000 members in that division. I've been an active researcher for more than 20 years and uh, I'm a fellow of ASME and the AIA stands for American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, associate fellow there and on the editorial board for six international journals. I was uh, inducted to be one for Georgia Tech Outstanding Young Engineer Alumni, and uh, won the AACE stands for American Society for Engin Engineering Education, uh, Outstanding New Mechanics Educator. So to talk uh, about today, we'll have the very brief outline. I will talk about some background and then some basic ideas the background the information basic ideas, I believe all you guys can understand. I assume you are all graduates, have some mechanics background. Then talking about the current applications of uh, the mechanics of structured genome and also technology transfer of mechanics of structured genome. Then after that, if we still have time, I will demo uh, how to use this uh, capability we are, use, uh, we are introducing here online, you can have some hands-on experience at the end. All you need is that you have computer. I think all you guys have computers and that's good enough. Okay, we know the bean theory. We learned in our undergraduate study, a kind of labor bean handed with a tip uh, load. It has been studied for more than, you know, six or 400 years. And if you look at the real uh, mathematical representation of the structure, it's a 3D body. And uh, what we do, usually we take the cross-section, okay? Based on the cross-section, we calculate the, you know, like the Young's modulus times cross-section area. 
that become my extension stiffness EI, which is the Young's modulus times my uh, area moment of inertia. That's my bending stiffness. Then you have GTA and the GA. Those are the shear stiffness and torsional stiffness. And then what do you do? You reduce to a one dimensional problem to solve your problem. For example, the bending problem is a force order uh, ordinary differential equation if you don't have a distributive force there. Okay. After you solve that, then you don't stop there. You know, you have EI there because it's a bending problem. You only need the bending difference. What you do is that you use the uh, formula here called the uh, MY over I. That's the formula we use to figure out what will be the maximum stress. Then we apply our uh, figure criterion, the maximum allowables to make sure that we design the structure right. Okay. And if you look at the, in this more advanced research terminology, you'll find out from the 3D body to 1D body, you can either call it a homogenization. Basically, you homogenize the cross-section into a material point, or you can call it a, as a dimensional reduction because you reduce a 3D problem to a one-dimensional problem, okay? And so that, uh, that procedure for you to get the set of the cross-sectional properties and also the one-dimensional model and the one-dimensional model you want. And this being analysis, you can call it global analysis or microscopic analysis. Some of you may be a research student deal with micromechanics, model scale modeling, you know, this homogenization, then you know what I'm talking about. Then when you try to calculate sigma x, it's actually the dehomogenization because you, you based on the global information, which is the bending moment, from the global analysis, you calculate the three-dimensional information that your local field. And uh, this part, usually, you know, in our undergrad student study, we don't talk about that much. We basically use a set of assumptions to, to calculate these properties, and then we directly solve the 1D problem and use that formula. But really, if you uh, look at particular look at in a more general terms, it becomes so-called constitutive modeling because it will provide me the constitutive relations for the one-dimensional model. It will also help me to construct a new model out of the original 3D model. Then we, some of you also learned the classical plate theory uh, dealing with uh, you know bending of a panel. And you'll find out that the classical, if you learn composite, then you also learn so-called classical lamination theory. But only difference is that it made multiple layers. What we do, we usually start from the Cauchy-Hoff assumption for the kinematics. Then we also use the plane stress assumption for the stresses. And uh, after this two set of assumptions, we can derive the two-dimensional model of what I'm showing here. But then now it basically uh, become a theory only formulated in terms of x1, x2, the implant surfaces, the reference surfaces. You have constituent relations here, ABD matrix in mechanics of composite. Then you have displacements and strain relations, uh, two dimensional, and also you have the equilibrium equations for the two, two dimensional model. And if you look at the in a way of what I try to set the stage for the constitutive modeling, you will find out you take what you do is that you through the thickness, because the ABD is the integration through the thickness. Through the thickness analysis, you will get your ABD uh, matrix. Then you have your ABD matrix, you will do your share uh, play the element analysis. That's what your final elements you learn here, but you didn't learn how to get this guy. And uh, after you solve your play the problem, you will get your uh, implant strains and curvatures and force and moments, then you can calculate the stress within each layer. Then you can apply your failure criterion there. And again, from the 3D machine model, you reduce your surface model, that's the homogenization, because you homogenize the material line in the thickness direction into a material point. And uh, based on the implant strains and curvature, you try to calculate three dimensional stress, that's the homogenization. And again, this part is called constitutive modeling. And uh, you will say that uh, this is different only and also makes sense or more familiar with you 
if you you are doing something related with model scale modeling. And this is very important and needed these days because of the heterogeneity of the materials we are creating with advanced manufacturing techniques. And the traditional structure modeling approach, if you uh, have studied structure mechanics, you will find out they we usually start from uh, some a priori, uh, you know, some ad hoc assumptions, a priori assumptions. We try to, for example, we want to construct the plate model. We try to express the three-dimensional plate displacement in terms of two-dimensional functions, plus some known distributions through the thickness, which usually is the zoom, like the classical lamination theory, first order shear deformation theory, high order theory, zigzag models. There are a lot of models. Uh, it's all based on different assumptions. But the problem with uh, these assumptions is that the accuracy and the generality. When you make the assumptions, then your models are only as good as the assumptions. For example, you, you do the classical model, you take the coach hole for assumption, you will not get the transverse normal strain because you assume them to be zero. And you take the plane stress assumption, you will not get the plane stress, out of plane stresses, transverse shear stress and transverse normal stresses because you assume them to be zero from the very beginning. And also sometimes the assumptions are self-conflicting, although usually professors don't tell you that. For example, when you do the class core nomination theory, you use coach hole for assumption, that's a plain stream assumption. Then you take the plain stress assumption. Plain stream and plain stress doesn't the code, you know, do not coexist. They are not compatible. They are conflicting with each other. And they are compatible only if, even for isotropic materials, only if that the Poisson effects are equal to zero. And so there is no rational way to know the accuracy laws. You know, you can always increase, make your assumptions more and more sophisticated, but you don't know how much accuracy you lost. So at the end of the day, in the industry, people end up with the simplest model, like the for, for composite laminates, they end up in using classical lamination theory, because at least that's the simplest. You know, you can create more sophisticated models and theories, but uh, if we even know, if the accuracy is not guaranteed, then there's no use. And also for high, you know, high order models, we have to introduce new kinematic variables. Then for that uh, case, we need to uh, create a special purpose elements. And that's not easy because if you take Abacus, ANSYS, or Lastron, they have standard elements there. And you want to create all your own elements and uh, put a lot of effort, not robust, not uh, you know, guaranteed accuracy, then maybe you spend a lot of effort uh, and doesn't give, get any return in that sense. And also the assumptions for mechanics might fail for other phases. If you're dealing with model physics problem, then you make assumptions for mechanics, but not necessarily work for temperature or, or electricity, for example, if you're dealing with smart systems. And also new materials, you'll find out we will require new assumptions. Then, you know, there are every increased number of new materials because of the manufacturing techniques. Then it, it pushes us to always come up with new assumptions. That's not a good idea. And the last but not least, there is no intuitive connection with conventional materials. You know, then you'll find out for every new structure and every new material, then you have to come up with a new theory that then we uh, basically have a endless chase of the wind. Uh, that's not a good idea for, for us to come up with a good theory. And also you'll find out this typical approach will be difficult to handle heterogeneous and build up structures like you have a stiff cylinder. Then you find out it's difficult to do this type of assumptions. For example, you have a honeycomb sandwich structure. It's also difficult to do so. You could have a panel like this with holes everywhere, but you still want to analyze the vibration modes of the bending, okay? And you could also have a helicopter rotor blade, for example, with the skins made of hundreds of layers and filled with the foam material. You could have built up wind, but when you do your preliminary design, you want to treat it as a beam to find out its extension 
and bendy and torsion stiffness needed for your area elasticity analysis. And then you could have stiff, you know, stiffened panels. You could have structures like this. All these challenge our traditional way to handle structures. What is the EA? If you want the extension stiffness, say, what is the E? What is the A? Because this guy have different layups and uh, this face sheet and core have different Young's modulus. What is your E? What is your A? You have holes there. So it's getting difficult. So that's not the way to go. And also another point I want to make is that we constantly confuse materials and structures. You know, that, uh, that, that's also uh, not good. And, uh, but the, it's a confusion point in our traditional study. And if you look at that uh, materials and structures, they are different. And the first is the presence of boundaries. A structure we're talking about a body has a specific boundary, have a defined geometry, have a defined support interaction with the external world. But material, when you're talking about aluminum, for example, you're talking about material, it doesn't mean, doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's one meter long or a three meter thick, it's still aluminum, okay? But when you're talking about cantilever beam, you're talking about the, the specific bar with the specific cross section and clamp that at the right one end. So it's presence of the boundary, that's different. Second, the characterization. The material properties and structure properties, they are different. Material properties, we're talking about the Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, uh, CTEs, and the densities. The structure properties, we're talking about bending stiffness, extension stiffness, you know, this type of stuff, torsional stiffness. And the behavior will be different. Material behavior, we're talking about hardening, softening, uh, linear elastic, hyperelastic, that viscous elastic, plastic. That's material behavior, but structure behavior, talking about buckling, vibration, deflection, you know, this, this kind of uh, things, it would be different. And also the models, material models could be linear and nonlinear, and structures models could have in terms of beam models, plate and shear models, or 3D solid models. And this is a paper published uh, four years ago in, uh, uh, on science and uh, basically they made a unit cell like that. They claim that they made a material, three dimensional uh, mechanical meta material with a twist, which means when you compress, it will twist. And, uh, but they, the finding is that if you have individual unit cell, yes, you will have this behavior. But if you repeat the same unit cell all the directions, this behavior will disappear. So that is actually not a material behavior, it's a structure behavior, it's a so-called extension twist property. That you even don't have to use this fancy unit cell to, to achieve it. You can easily achieve it by just uh, uh, have uh, two unidirectional fiber reinforced composite and one is 45 degree, another negative 45 degree. You will get the extension and twist the coupling, which means when you compress the word twist or when you Pull the watch chase. So that's the confusion uh, about structures, materials. And uh, some of you may heard about the materials genome initiative. What they trying to do is that they try to use experimental methods, computational methods, and the data analytics to design new materials cheaper and faster. And the materials genome initiative is focused on the at the molecules level, at the atoms level, the tools usually use these so-called uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation and like lamps and all that. And the deliverables, what they come out is they constitute models and properties for constituents, like if we're dealing with composites, then for fibers, matrix, and the interfaces we need. But if we're dealing with the composite structure, we'll find out that the our system could be in the size of meters, depends on what system you're talking about. But the fiber, the enforcements, the face of the material could be in terms of microns, smaller than human hair, you can use it to make an airplane. Then you'll find out you have a significant scale to jump here, at least six orders of magnitude. 
And uh, you are learning finite elements. You know that I don't know whether you guys are already dealing with 3D models. You'll find out that it's difficult to cross three scales. Uh, what do I mean is here that, for example, if you have one meter by one meter by one meter cube, then it will be very difficult to have your element size is in millimeter because you will have 1,000 times, 1,000 times, 1,000. That will be one billion elements that your computers cannot handle it. I don't know whether at the University of Utah you have a, a high performance computer can can handle it or not. Usually you can handle up to one million elements. And uh, if you have fiber in terms of microns, you want to capture the detail of the fibers, then you need your element size as small as the fiber. You cannot bigger than fiber, then you animal contain the fiber and some of the matrix material. That's not good. You don't know how to assign the material properties now. So in the microns, you want to analyze the Boeing 787. That's impossible. That's in terms of dozens of meters. Right? You have basically 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6. How many animals you have? That's just uh, you know too big, uh, only comparable with our national data, I think. So the traditional way to handle this kind of problem is that they use a bottom up model scale modeling to take the microstructure, do some micromechanics calculations, get the so-called equivalent material properties, then do the structure analysis. And uh, uh, within each subject, there are different series that many and with different assumptions. So I don't have to mention about that. But even this approach by itself, separate between micromechanics and structure mechanics, I rely on a, a fundamental assumption, so-called scale separation assumption. For example, you have a panel uh, with reinforced uh, fibers like this, okay? That's your original structure. If you do, do this kind of like a button up model scale modeling, you calculate effective properties, then you replace the original panel with something like this. And you create an artificial discontinuity between the interfaces. Because originally you have, if you have perfect bonding, then all you have is the, the, between the different layers, they are perfect bonding, they have the same reason material. But now because of the fiber and different orientations, you actually made them to be different materials. The material discontinuity happen at the layer interface. Originally should be between the fiber and the matrix. So you will not get the space concentration right. And uh, usually if we know our fibers much smaller than the layer thickness, then this approach works for the global deformation like deflection, vibration, buckling, but it will not work for the local stresses, particularly for the damage and failure. That's why in composite area, the damage of failure is still an open, open question. And uh, for structures like honeycomb sandwich structure, then the traditional way to do is that they take a unit cell, do a calculation, then get the so-called equi equivalent Young's modulus and all that, then replace this with the homogeneous material, then do a laminate theory. And that's not good, the reason being that now, the size of the unit cell is similar to thickness of the structure. If you want to do homogenization, you have to do homogenization together. You cannot do homogenization of the unit cell first because the scale separation assumption does not work anymore. So those are the issues with the traditional approaches. And what I have been doing is that to look at the problem from different perspective from the systems perspective. For example, for a sophisticated engineering structure like the airplane here, when you do structure analysis, it's a combination of 3D bodies, plates and shells, beams and thin walled beams. And depends on the geometry. You know, if all three dimensions are of similar size, it's a 3D body. If your thickness is much smaller than implant dimension, it's a, it's a plate or shell, depends on whether it's curved or not. If you have one of the dimension much larger than the two other dimensions, it's a beam. If all three dimensions is of different order of magnitude, they're all very different size, it will be a single beam. Then when you do a finite element analysis, what you do, 
is a combination of three distorted elements, two d plate and shear elements, one d pin elements. That's how you do. That's that's how you form your model. But as a engineer, you should realize that your single nine element here could represent a box pin, which each wall made of for say twenty layers of unidirectional fiber reinforced composite. And uh, a surface element here could represent a stiffened panel with the face sheet and stiffness made of woven composite. And uh, similarly, it could represent a honeycomb sandwich structure or a stiffened panel or other type of sandwich structures. And uh, what we need to do is how do we make sure this nine element can represent my reality? This is my mathematical artifact or construct model and this is my reality <clears throat> if you look at that behind each element there is a corresponding model and you'll find out that each model you have three parts one is called kinematics dealing with geometry strain displacements and the kinetics dealing with the force and stress and the equilibrium equation of motion if you're dealing with dynamics and the energetics those are the constituent relations usually this part is not talking about that much in our final element course or structural mechanics course, but this part is important, particularly with the advance of materials technology. How to get this material properties is important. How to get the constituent relations. Because these equations, nobody changes. They are basically established hundreds of years ago, and these are all programmed in Abacus answers and uh, you know, all these codes. Look at that the abacus, right? What's more important if you have a new material, you need to have a new UMAT for that. Everything else is already programmed. Okay, so this the research focus for material structures really focus on gauging the material property, gauging the constituent relations. So the method that I come up with is called mechanics of structure genome. It's basically look at what the material is made of and also look at what the model you want for your system design, then you minimize the loss of information between these two models. And uh, uh, we focus on the length scale from the microns to the big structure scale, because this, uh, this type of uh, systems can be described by continuum mechanics safely. And we also implement our theory into a code called the SwiftConf. And we have time, then we will demonstrate later. And it's a formal, fr formal framework that, do not, that does not exclusively rely on information passing. The traditional model scale modeling just to do kind of single scale, then do direct data passing between different scales. But this uh, framework operates from the homogenized behavior, capture details at the scales, relevant to a particular design. For example, I want to treat this wind as a beam, then I'm interested in the torsion and bending stiffness because that's how do I uh, predict my flutter and divergence uh, due to the aerodynamic force. And this series is pretty simple. There's three basic steps. One step is, first step is that uh, express the kinematics of the model you know the original model in terms of model you want. And you have displacements, you have the strains, then this is displacement of the original model. This U bar is the displacement of your global model, the model you want. And this is the strain of the new your original model. And this Y bar is your strains of the model you want. Then you express the information, for example, if you're dealing with elastic behavior, then total potential energy will be good, right? Because you can use the principle of total potential energy to derive all the equations you want or to do the numerical implementation in your final elements. Then you express the information of the original model in terms of the kinematic variables of the model you want. Then you minimize the loss of information of the original model and the model you want. You solve for the W. W is something you don't know which can help you to minimize the information loss between the original model and the model you want. For example, if we're dealing with 3D bodies, depends on this 
3D body is made up, if it's made of layered composites, we can treat these two segments as my so-called structure gene. That's the smallest mathematical building block of my structure. Using this, I can compute my Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, all that. And if you're dealing with anisotropic materials, you need a six by six thickness matrix. If it's made of fiber reinforced composite, then you're dealing with a two dimensional domain. And uh, this two dimensional domain will help you to get the six by six thickness matrix. If you have particle reinforced composites or composite has, has three dimensional heterogeneity, you need a 3D domain. And uh, all this does is to give you the constituent properties you need for your 3D analysis, your inputs for your final element code, like Young's modulus in all different directions, Poisson's ratios, and uh, shear moduli. And uh, after you do the global analysis, if you want to find out what the stress happens in the original structure, say within fiber, you need to do dehomogenization. Based on the stress you calculate this level, you can do dehomogenization, find out what happened there. And if you know micromechanics, then you'll find out this is kind of like a general micromechanics approach. And this is really looks like your RVE, but uh, it's different from the traditional RVE analysis. Some of you know the RVE analysis. First, the most difficult part of RVE analysis is that you need to apply boundary conditions. And also you need to apply the correct boundary conditions. But for this approach, you don't have to apply boundary conditions. Remove the biggest pain. Uh, second is that uh, it will automatically satisfy your mental condition. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like a fundamental lemma for micromechanics. And third, there's no pre and post processing. You don't have to apply load, then calculate stress, average stress, then compute your Young's modulus. We don't have to do that. And this approach is semi-analytical it will converge faster than our E analysis. Second, we compute the 3D properties and the stress and stream field out of 1D and 2D 3D analysis. For example, a traditional approach when they're dealing with fiber reinforced composites, if they want a 3D property, they will have a 3D block to do the analysis. But using our approach, you only need a 2D domain. Reduce from, you know, cut one dimension, you will save a lot of complexity and also computational cost. And uh, we can compute the complete set of 3D properties used in one analysis. When you do RVE analysis, usually you apply the load in certain direction, apply the boundary condition in certain direction, calculate the material property in that direction. Then do another way, do another way. If you need the all 3D properties, you need to carry all the analysis six times. And for us, it's only one time. And also it's more versatile. It's a single theory for all heterogeneous materials. Could it be periodic, partially periodic, or even a periodic. And it could be arbitrary shape. You don't have to be a cuboid, you know, rectangular or square or cube. This kind of RV is unnecessary. It could be arbitrary. And it's also more accurate. For 3D periodic materials, we found out that we can achieve the same accuracy as RVE analysis. And for partial periodic and aperiodic materials, we will always achieve the best accuracy. For example, this is the typical black aluminum approach. And a lot of people don't think in problem this way. And what they do is that they want to get the equivalent Young's modulus Poisson's ratio of for a stack of composite laminate. So you have multiple layers. What you want is a homogeneous material and is anisotropic, then the traditionally how people do that the people get the in-plane properties using the classical lamination theory and get out of plane properties using different assumptions. And if you're using our approach, what do you need to ask the fundamental question is what is this 3D model, which is a continuum mechanics model uh, established for each layer? And what is the model you want is a 3D continuum mechanics, but it is not heterogeneous anymore, it's homogeneous. Then what will be the fundamental building block, your structure gene, will be the transverse normal line. Then you minimize the energy loss, you will get all the properties you need. How about if we have panel, we want to use plate and shear elements. 
Again, it depends on how the panel is made of. If the panel made of kind of like laminate or sandwich structures, you'll find out that you all you need to deal with is the transverse normal line. And if your panel is a corrugated structure, like something like this, you have straws and all that, then you're dealing with a two-dimensional domain. If it's a stiffened panel, then you're dealing with straight block. But what you want is the equivalent plate property for you to do the vibration buckling, those type of analysis. And uh, out of this 1D, 2D, and 3D analysis, it will generate your equivalent plate properties. After you do your plate analysis, you can back calculate all the stresses and strains within the original structure, like apply your failure criteria and all that. And if you know the, you know, the theory of the structures, particular related with panels, then you'll find out for laminates, you have a theory. For corrugated place, you have a theory. For stiffened place, you have a theory. For sandwich structures, you either have another theory. But for us, we find out this simple theory, the single theory applies to all structures. As long as you want to model the structure using plate elements, then our theory will help you to construct the best plate model to use. That's the first point. Second point, we know that the theory of plates and shells is a different subject belongs to structure mechanics. It has nothing related with model scale modeling, even micro mechanics. But here, if you use the concept of structure gene, you will find out that uh, it is the theory of place and shells become a special application of micro mechanics. You only need to view the reference surface as a generalized continuum, two dimensional continuum. Then every material point here, you have a corresponding microstructure to give you the equivalent properties, which is the equivalent uh, plate properties, and also to help you to calculate the, the corresponding local fields. So basically, structural mechanics and the micro mechanics is unified by this concept in a very elegant way. And uh, let's look at take the classical lamination theory for example. As I mentioned, for the classical lamination theory, we use which call for assumption for the kinematics, and also we use the uh, plane stress for the stress field. But if you use MSG, what you need to do is that look at what is the original model, the 3D elasticity model, and establish for each layer. What model you want is the surface model. What is the structure gene? It will be the uh, through the cyclic material line. Then we minimize the energy loss. It will help us to construct the model without any assumptions used by the traditional approaches. And uh, in other words, we will have all the six stream components, all the six stress components, not like uh, the classical lamination theory. You can only get the implant streams and the implant stresses. How about the for very long structures? Then you're dealing with so-called beam elements. You will use a beam element to do the analysis. For example, if you want to simulate this system, Usually the rotor blade are represented by a beam. Then you do the flat dynamic simulation. If the beam is made of, can be approximate, if this cylinder structure can be approximate as uh, uh, made of uniform cross-section or a piecewise uniform cross-section, then your structure gene will be the cross-section. And if you also have heterogeneity along the lens direction, then you're dealing with 3D block. What you want is the beam properties, bending stiffness, torsional stiffness, and uh, all the others, you know, shear stiffness. And you do your beam analysis. Then after you've done your beam analysis, you want to get the 3D stresses. So again, you'll find out that this method provides a unified way to deal with any structure you want to model as a beam element. And also, beam theory is the first and simplest structure mechanics theory. But if you use this concept of structure gene, you'll find out that uh, it becomes a special application of micro mechanics. If you treat the reference now as a 1D continuum, then every material point, you'll have a corresponding microstructure to help you to do the homogenization, to get the equivalent properties, and also get the local fields. So that way, the theory of beams 
also become a spatial micromechanics applications. And we also have the similar things like this. This is also uh, illustrated the, the same idea. If you want to construct the Euler-Bernoulli B model for a composite structure, what you do, you use the Euler-Bernoulli assumptions, cross-section remain plain and uh, normal and rigid, and also use uniaxial stress assumption for the stress field. But for us, you only need to use the original model and uh, tell me what the model you want and take the cross-section as your structure gene, you minimize the energy loss, you can construct the model automatically without the Euler-Bernoulli assumptions, without the uniaxial stress assumptions. Okay, the next, let's go to the applications. And the first application we have is uh, try to do the design analysis of composite boons for NASA, that's what we do here. And uh, we have a small video here, you can see. It's pretty big. It's a very long structure. But if you look at the, uh, the cross-section, it's made of composites and have a complex geometry like a omega. And also, it's a uh, complexity that uh, when it's on, on the ground, it's storage, it's tagged. OK, then it will be deployed. Uh, in the space. And uh, because it's, uh, it's a polymer-based material, when you package it, you basically stress it. Then you have the viscous elastic behavior. The material will relax. The spin energy will relax. Originally, you designed that you're supposed to be able to deploy, but find out that you don't have the you know, strength for you to push it all that anymore. So they want us to, to figure out how to design the system in such a way that when you, de you know, in the space, you can still deploy it. And when you deploy, it's still street, not a banana, because they must have a street boom so that they will provide enough support for the, uh, you know, solar sail and other space structures. And you will find out they, they did some trial and error when they deploy, uh, in, when they deployed, they could have up to 14 centimeter difference there from a street line. So that's something they don't want to say. And also, they designed to be, uh, you know, the the total, uh, the maximum width is 23 millimeter. But after it deployed, it actually becomes 16 millimeter. It's only, you know, it's reduced 30 percent. And uh, all this can be predicted and can be analyzed using our method because it's basically when it's deployed is a beam and when it's packed is a shell and it's made of woven composite. And this is what we did uh, for the simulation because it's made of woven composite. Then for each yarn, you have fiber and matrix. Then you make the yarn, then you make the woven fabric. Then you lay up together, you make the boom. Okay. And uh, those are the tests, a typical, they call the column bending test. We can simulate the test using Abacus uh, without any problem. And uh, what we do is that we need to calculate our equivalent play the property, viscous elastic play the property in terms of fiber matrix properties. Then uh, implement that UMAT for Abacus then Ibacus can do the nonlinear simulation. And this is a simulator for us how to pack the structure and also deploy the structure. And the packaging is, is relatively easier, but when you deploy it, then you got a significant nonlinearity non there. It's not that uh, easy. And it's, uh, you know, it will run more than 10 hours on our workstations. And you have to keep in, in mind that those are just not the typo, typical linear elastic materials. Those materials, all the material properties, they compute in terms of fiber matrix properties, and also they are changing with respect to time. 
because they are viscous elastic. Uh, the next uh, uh, application we have is that uh, we try to basically homogenize the stack of uh, all the 3D elements because if you really deal with heterogeneous system, if you make a big system, then you find out you have too, any, too many elements to deal with. And we want to homogenize to one element. So this, you could have thousands or tens of thousands of elements. Here, just a single eight loaded element or 20 loaded element. So still the same thing, you use the same idea. What is the original model? It's a heterogeneous system with many elements needed to describe the material details. And uh, what is the model you want? You want a microscopic model is a single, single homogeneous element. And what you need to compute is the effective element stiffness. And uh, you were, you, we will use MSD to do the homogenization, get the equivalent element stiffness matrix, the K matrix for this element. Then after we solve the global model, we can also do the homogenization to find out what the local stress and strain happened in the original system. So you have much, um, uh, much more or less number of elements but still get almost the same accuracy as our original system. And what we need to do is just to minimize the energy loss between the original one and this, uh, the, the, the new one we want. And uh, the, the another application we are working on is right now is the uh, machine learning, assisted uh, motor scale structure, uh, structure modeling. You learn finite elements, you learn mechanics, but now machine learning come out, you may question the value of learn all the equations, shape functions, cost integrations, and all that stuff. And uh, it looks like we can deal everything with data. Uh, let me use a very brief uh, history of science to illustrate point. The first guy, maybe most of you guys don't know him, uh, Tico Brahe. And he actually was the professor of uh, Carlos Kepler and Kepler. And uh, I think uh, most of us heard about Kepler. He had these three laws of, uh, you know, uh, the, how the heavenly bodies move around each other, right? Equal areas, you know, equal times like, around the equal area and all that. Those are the Kepler's laws three laws of motion for heavenly bodies. And where, where did he get it? He get it from the data observed by his professor, Brahe. And he's a genius. He's also a mathematician. And uh, I don't know whether this is the machine learning can still do that or not. And uh, I mean, they, unfortunately, Brahe's, Brahe's uh, data is not available. If it's available, we can use the most advanced machine technique, machine learning techniques. May not be able to obtain the three laws of physics by Kepler. So even if it can do it, but not many people can remember it anymore, right? We learned in physics when we were in middle school or high school, but we could not remember it anymore. But we know this guy, Newton. We know this guy and the, Everybody know F equal to MA. Everybody know the uni universal law of gravitation, right? And then this type of knowledge is what we learn in our classroom. You find an element method, your mechanics series is what you learn there. That's what I call it ep ep epistic knowledge. And uh, what you have there is data then you have empirical knowledge. Based on data, you can obtain empirical knowledge. And, uh, but uh, epistemic, ep epistemic knowledge, we need a human intelligence, artificial intelligence, sometimes is not good enough. We need to do abstraction, abstraction. And uh, what the Newton's law can apply not only to heavenly bodies, it also to the molecules, right? The molecule dynamics simulation is nothing but 
but a bunch of F equal to MA. And if you look at how they implement the equations, but if you do the data machine learning, what you learned can only apply to what your data, the, the objects you generate the data. You cannot uh, use like F equal to MA can apply to airplanes and also apply to cars and apply to human bodies and also to all the other stuff. Okay, so this generalize, generalization abstraction, uh, it will be done by real intelligence. So what you learn in the classroom is distilled by history, you know, hundreds of years at least, some of them like, like geometry, thousands of years. There's a real knowledge, uh, kind of like a cumulative wisdom of humans. And that's much more advanced than machine learning. But I'm not saying that machine learning is not important. Machine learning is important and helpful, particularly we know that our human knowledge is not unlimited. We cannot know everything. And we cannot know everything. And for example, that when you're dealing with nonlinear behavior, a lot of the times they constitute models, the material model is assumed. You don't have knowledge. And what we can do is that uh, we find out that uh, where do we need help for machine learning? First, the computing time, right? I mentioned that you could have millions of elements. Then when you want to do a design problem with your big final element model, that's not feasible. So you need to reduce the computing time. Machine learning can help you to do that, to construct very good uh, circuit model form free circuit model to, to do that and to reduce the time. And second is that we make assumptions in our mechanics theory, like Hooke's law, basically the lazy assumption. We just assume that space to spin must be related linearly. That's, uh, that's the simplest relations we could have, but we don't know. We don't have a certain knowledge on that, but based on our objects, based on the operating data, we can make the data to learn what is not known. That's, that's very good. And uh, the third assumption is geometry and topology of the microstructure. You know, that is also sometimes we don't know, for example, the uh, heterogeneous materials. We, we are doing some idealistic microstructure, but the real microstructure may not looks like that. Then we can use machine learning to help us to figure out those information beyond what we could understand. So we can reduce the time by replace physics based model scale modeling use circuit modeling. Uh, circuit models trained by machine learning. We can also learn micro scale models and properties using major data as the, as the microscopic scale by physics informed and the physics constrained or sometimes called physics guided machine learning. And we can also construct digital microstructures out of the major, da major data using machine learning by extracting the, the typical features of the microstructure. So those are all we can use it to help. And uh, we have did some work on that. And the most important work we did is that, you know, when you look at that, when my students approach me, they want to do something popular and uh, I told them that uh, we need to solve the problem it has not been solved. When you use Abacus, you'll find out the a very important part is you might, particularly when you're dealing with damage and nonlinear problems. Then how do we learn the you might by using Abacus? That's what we have been doing. And we had a few papers published if you're more interested, you are interested in this type of work. Uh, please let me know. I can send you the papers and we put you in, in contact with some of my students. And, and the last part is the technology transfer. And uh, we uh, linked our code with GMesh so that you can deal with general microstructures like what I'm showing here as honeycomb sandwich structure or linked with TechGen for uh, text gen, we can deal with text uh, composites. And also, you can download SwiftCom on your smartphone. We have both uh, iOS and Android, it's all free. 
is all free and you can use it. You can run your RVE analysis on your smartphones or on your iPad or on your computers. And uh, we also embedded our code into, there is an ARMY system called the Galaxy Rotor Design Optimization Framework. It's a digital system for the army to dealing with composites, uh, to dealing with helicopters, but they don't have a structured design module. We embed our code into that uh, uh, system. And we also integrated our code with Katia and uh, Altair Hypermesh and OptiStruck. Some of you heard about this code. And we also integrated with Apicus. There's a plugin you can directly download from the website and the ANSYS and uh, Nastra. So that you, you still have your traditional uh, finite element code, but you can deal with woven meta materials like this. And then you can deal with the, you know, all the other very advanced materials with different microstructures. So as a conclusion that the, the mechanics of structure genome bridge the gap between the materials and structures to harvest the full benefits of the advanced in materials uh, research and development so that you can still use your traditional design tools, but you can tap into the benefits of advanced materials. You cannot say, oh, I only learned fine elements. I don't know how to do composites. With my code, you'll know how to do composites. You'll know how to do meta materials. You'll know how to do different panels, all that. You don't have to learn another class. And secondly, it provides a unified modeling for structures materials featuring anisotropy and heterogeneity. It uh, eliminates invalid scale separation and the assumptions within the scales. And uh, it achieves direct numerical simulation accuracy as the efficiency of engineering models. And it uh, enables us to model composites or other advanced materials as simple as metals, capture details as needed and affordable. With this code, you basically can take your favorite final element code to deal with all the advanced materials and structures. And uh, another one is uh, within the university environment, you will find out that uh, uh, this has uh, intellectual value because it unifies micromechanics and structure mechanics for multi scale structure modeling. And uh, this professor, Jacob Bronowski, in his book, The Creative Aspects of Science, is, he says that the progress of science is discovery at each step, a new order which gives unity to what had long seemed unlike. So Faraday did this when he closed the link between electricity and the mechanism, and uh, Maxwell did it when he linked both with light. Einstein linked time with space and mass with energy. So science is nothing else than search for the search. They search to discover the unity in the wild variety of natures. Now in the structures, in the material, there's so many models out there. MST, mechanics of structure, you know, unifies them all. Beans, place, and shells, similar beans, sandwich structures, all that you'll find out it can be handled using this simple concept, MHG. This is the last slide. It's kind of like a poster. Those are the structures we dealt with before. Uh, we, have we have many more, just typical ones. And we can deal with short fiber systems, woven composites, uh, road plates with cross sections, and the laminates, and the curved unit cells, and have something like this, weird ones. You could have meta materials, 3D woven and braided materials. And then it can be applied to all different systems. And uh, the basic concept uh, is the mechanics of structure genome you know, to minimize loss of information between two different models. The model you know and the model you want is a top-down structure modeling framework that models relevant structure behavior in terms of microstructure details as needed and affordable, you as an engineer decide uh, uh, what kind of model to use, then this theory would 
deliver you the based model you want. It can do virtual testing of the materials and structures, not only mechanical properties and the model functional properties. It can also do model scale modeling of structures, including composites, different structures, build up structures, sandwich structures, uh, you name it. And it can all handle that. So this is the main lecture we have here. And I will stop to take uh, a few questions you may have. Then we go to hands-on demonstration. Uh, thank you, Professor Yu, for this very nice lecture. And I especially like the the phone app. I mean, finally, students can replace their Twitter and TikTok with something more useful. Mm -hmm. So, guys, if you have any questions for Professor Yu, uh, please. You can unmute yourself or use the chat box. Yeah, whatever you wish. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah, is it me? Okay, go ahead, Al. Hi. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, uh, so, I, uh, I, you talked about um, a artificial intelligence and machine learning um, to kind of. Uh, help with the um, multi-scale structural model modeling. Um, I <clears throat> and you talked about the um, limitation of that process. Uh, one of them was um, computing time. I was wondering is also data availability, especially at the micro scale would be um, um, a struggle um, or I'm, I'm not sure how, how much data are available at the micro scale um, modeling. So yeah, that's, you will find out that the, indeed there are not a lot of data available at the micro scale. For example, usually we don't, don't know the Young's modulus of the fiber along the transverse direction. We know along the fiber direction but now the transverse direction is so hard to measure because you only have a six micron and how do you make a tensile bar out of that? How do you cut the tensile bar? That's, that's just very difficult. What you can measure is that you can measure it at the, uh, the global level. For example, you have a beam, but made of different materials, but then you can, you, know, you can reverse engineer. That's what I'm saying. You, you don't know your fiber property. You don't have the micro scale property, but when you make a wind or make a you know, car, you have the operating data. You can take data out there and uh, try to refine your micro scale model. You basically use the machine learning to learn what is what you don't know. Using the macro scale data to be implemented. Yeah, you don't have the micro scale, micro -scale. data, but you yeah. can you can basically have a form free model for your micro scale stuff. What you can measure is at the structure level. Then yeah, you yeah. can basically do the back calculation to reverse engineering to to the, this is called back propagation to find out what will be the micro scale data. We we had some papers on that, and how do you? Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Excuse me, I have a question. Uh huh. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you, Doctor Yu, for your presentation. I have a question. You know, it is very interesting that your proposed model allow us to have some uh, simplification in our FEM models that would be highly beneficial but i yeah, have another question most i think that the, some of the example you showed we are currently uh, able to solve by conventional fe models but with the proposed model it is much easier is there any example that uh, for example there is a problem that we cannot solve using other available yeah, fem package but it would be um, uh, uh, it, uh, like it would be possible uh, to solve with your I proposed model. Be way faster, but or, I'd be happy to show you after your deadlines. Yeah. 
just some other information, yeah, background, background noise, I don't know where it comes from. I can show you in person on my desk how to do some stuff. So this is awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, so to answer your question, that uh, it's uh, it's impossible because of the computational like power. Uh, let me see. Cool. Uh, can you mute that awesome. person? Um, let me know oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that, uh, for example, the road blade, right? I'm talking about that the simple road blade problem. Let me see. You know, the road blade, usually the skins is about, uh, about uh, you know, 100 layers, which means through the thickness, because each layer is about a few microns, then your element size should be at that level. Then you're talking about a, just the simple one blade. You're talking about a billion elements. What's the biggest finite element you have, the model you have created so far? Next time when you open the code, try to create a, a model with 10 mini elements. Just do it, uh, say, you know, 300 multiply 300 multiply 300 elements. Then, then it will crash your computer. I'm pretty sure you, you, it will crash your computer. And that's not a lot, as I mentioned to you, right? Uh, let me see here. Maybe that information I didn't. Uh, If you really want to capture fiber details, for example, one millimeter cube material block, one millimeter, how big is that? You imagine it. You can barely see it by your eyes if you your eyesight is not that good now. Takes about 20 million degrees of freedom. That's a big finite element model. And uh, that's almost nothing comparing to, to a helicopter or to your Boeing 787. So the, 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 the impossibility is computational. It's computer, particularly when you do want to do the design optimization, you're talking about millions of runs of your big finite element model. Then you want to still retain the accuracy, but as fast as possible. That's all the basic idea of model scale modeling, you know, to basically reduce the computational effort. Uh, when, when you learn finite elements, you have the wrong assumption that finite elements solve everything. That's not true. You do a realistic problem, uh, like the helicopter rotor, rotor plate problem and gauge the stress within each layer accurately, then you find out that you cannot solve it just directly by the finite elements you know. Thank okay. you so much. Other... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? I have one. My well, students are yes. thinking about it. So I, I'm not. I, I never. I, I'm not familiar with the structured genome, but so uh, your models are all small strain models. So when you're doing homogenization, you, you're we, small we, strain? We have finite deformation models. Here, I just do uh, use the simplest model for illustration. Otherwise, it's hard to, to figure out. We have basically viscous elastic models. We have viscous plastic models. We have finite strain models. We also published on hyperelasticity models. So we have all that. OK, so that so means you also have like uh, thermal thermal elasticity models when you say hyper hyper elastic you mean by thermal thermal mechanical coupling models or yeah we have thermal mechanical coupling and anything you can do by rve let me put that way we can do it in a much smarter way and much more efficient way and simpler way and also can link to the structures directly oh, okay what about costra continuum like generalist continuum do, can, can you do that with your module with, with your oh yeah yeah of course of course yeah yeah. So you can do high high and order. 
visualization. Yeah, high order theory because you have a, it's basically you have, you know, look at here. And there is a possibility for us, say the, the original material model is Cauchy continuum. You construct a coarser continuum. Mm -hmm. Basically, the original model you know is Cauchy, it's a Cauchy continuum. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, uh, the original model is a Cauchy continuum. At the structure level, you need a coarser continuum. You minimize the loss of information between these two models, you will get the effective properties for your Coursera continuum. To use. Uh, so you, you are starting from micro scale is standard Cauchy linear continuum, linear elastic, and then you upscale it to-, to not, not necessarily linear elastic, it could be hyper elastic. It could a, be- Any, a, any yeah. first, let's say any first order type of continuum. We're just looking at yeah. small strains yeah. and uh, the gradient, not the, the, not, not the strain gradient. And then you upscale mm -hmm. it to, any kind of continuum, generalized continuum, like yeah. continuum. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's basically this. The simple idea it is illustrated here is that you have two models, and uh, you know that you have one with finite scale, one with a coarse scale, but the models could be different. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's that's similar. What what can be done with asymptotic homogenization? Because you basically yes. do a similar thing. But uh, you will find out when you extend that to P and place and shells, it will be much more difficult than first. Second is that, uh, as I mentioned here, you know, when you get 3D properties, people will use 3D domain to do it. And yeah. we will use 2D domain. And uh, we can compute the 3D properties, just one analysis, and using even 1D domain, 2D domain, or 3D domain. Hmm. And okay. we don't have to worry about the boundary conditions and do the pre and post processing, as I said. And also, asymptotic homogenization, it only applies to periodic materials. And uh, if it's not periodic, then because at the very beginning, they're doing periodic functions. Yeah. Right? So it only applies, theoretically, only applies to periodic materials. Exactly. But for us, we can apply to periodic, partially periodic, and periodic materials. Okay, so it sounds excellent. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a much more extended and a much more powerful approach. And as I said, even for three D pure, I mentioned here for three D pure audio materials, we can reproduce the results as three D RE using three D domain with pure boundary condition and also asymptotic homogenization. Mm -hmm. It works the same. But uh, for others, then you have no equivalence. Yeah. And for yeah. pins and plates and shells. You have no equivalence. Hmm. And, uh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll have to I'll have to get into this. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to look into it. And uh, let me see. Was there, do we still have time to? We I can demonstrate. We have five minutes. If you wish, just a quick yeah. Quick overview of uh, your. Let me see. You can you see my yes. browser here? Yeah. So this is CDM Hub is a website I created for the whole world and to use and everybody can get it free. And uh, if, you, if you're interested in my research, I have my research cloud, uh, group in the cloud and there are more than 500, yeah, 540 members there. They're all interested in MSG and my code. And uh, what I want to do is that uh, to go to to demonstrate you the software, and by the way, you can use it directly on your on your computer after you have your account, and the account is free and you see the for free also free. So I launched the code, and uh, you can launch it on your iPad, Mac, or Windows or Linux machine as long as you have a browser connected to internet, smartphone. So for example, I want to do a simple uh textile composite and uh okay and you know the young property and matrix property and uh you want to you want to do the mesoscale scale 
Oh, I haven't uh, generated this. So you want to output the SwiftCon model, for example, for elastic solid model, you can do some elastic viscous elastic and uh, some viscous elastic. You can also do plate and shear model, beam model and all that. You can have a periodic uh, information. Let me just do a simple uh, solid model. I have a taste. So this will create the object for me. And now this is my properties. And if you do have a analysis, it will not be so quick. Mm. And you result, you have a results will not be better than my result. And we we can prove theoretically. And it's a it's a woven composite. When you do have a analysis, you have to apply even asymptotic, asymptotic homogenization. You have to do six analysis, apply different boundary conditions and all that. And you can you can get it very easily here. And you can do other analysis. And you can do 3D volumes and all that. And this, and uh, if you log into the website, I can directly share with you so that what I operate here, you can see it directly on your screen. So it's, it's, it's very good for teaching purpose. Mm. If a student wants to learn how to use the software, what I use is that say, hey, I do the first three steps, you do the last four steps. We can, we can collaborate that way. And by the way, if you have a code you want to share with others, the rest of the world, you, are, you can basically upload your code to our platform and uh, share with others. Excellent. It, it, the code has to be a certain like Python, C++, or it doesn't matter what kind of uh, interface? It, as long as it's workable under Linux environment. Okay. As long as it's uh, executable under Linux environment, we can make it like this. Mm -hmm. It can be used by Windows guys, by Mac guys, by smartphone guys. Okay. You could only need to be workable under Linux environment. Okay, so this will have Linux kernel. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because our kernel is Linux. Linux is the most efficient, and you don't have to worry about the license issue and all that. If you're dealing with Windows, have a Windows Server, yeah. you know, Windows 10 Server version, then you have a license. If you have 100 people launch it, then we cannot bear the cost. Now is that uh, everybody can launch it, and we can have hundreds of people use the same code at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And that's all I have. And if, feel free to explore this uh, platform if you want. And uh, you just need to sign up, create an account, and uh, then you can use all the tools. We have more than uh, 20 tools on this website. Excellent. Okay, I'll, I'll stop recording.